Spirit. Hello, my name is Sarah Reineveld, Chair of the 36. We are joined today by Justice Whitener, who is running for re-election to the Washington State Supreme Court. Justice, please go ahead with your two-minute introduction. Thank you. I'm Justice G. Helen Whitener. I was appointed to the Supreme Court in 2020 and subsequently elected that November to retain my position. I'm seeking your endorsement again to retain my seat for a full six-year term. Since joining the court, I have authored about 15 majority opinions and four dissents. I'm a former Pierce County Superior Court judge, a former Board of Industrial Insurance Appeals judge, a pro tem judge on the district and municipal courts. I'm also a former prosecutor, public defender, and managing partner of a law firm. I have received the highest rating of exceptionally well qualified from 14 Washington State Bar Associations. And I've been endorsed by all eight Supreme Court justices, numerous judges and elected officials throughout the state. I'm a faculty member of the National Judicial College and a former faculty member of the state's Judicial College. I chair the state's annual Judicial Conference Planning Committee overseeing the yearly education for all state judges. I am the appellate court representative to the state's Interpreter Commission and for five years, I've been a judicial member of the Washington State Office of Civil Legal Aid Oversight Committee. I'm the former co-chair of the state's Minority and Justice Commission. I'm on the board of directors of the International Association of IALGBTQ Judges. And I've taught street law for four years prior to the pandemic at Lincoln High School in Tacoma. Since I last saw you in 2020, I've received numerous additional awards for my services to the legal and non legal communities. I am asking for your endorsement because I believe I'm exceptionally well qualified. I believe I'm the best person for the position and, and I'm asking you to support that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will go ahead with our prepared questions. Alice, you have the first question and it is in the chat uh, for your reference. Thank you. Uh, what are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? What is your experience serving as a justice slash judge, uh, pro tem, or within the judicial system? And how will this inform your perspective on the bench? I have a unique background, legal background, in that I have been a public defender, prosecutor, and a judicial officer on all three levels of the trial level courts. And when I say all three positions, I mean all three on all three trial levels courts. So I have a lot of um, trial level experience and very intimate knowledge of the trial level courts here. Since joining the Supreme Court, I've reviewed trial level work. And as I've indicated, I've written a number of what I call eight uh, majority opinions, uh, receiving my eight colleagues signing off on my decisions. Um, the most recent was Mays v. Spokane County, which um, I would suggest anyone take a look at because it has some historical connections there. I also have a professional background as you've seen that is varied, but I also have a very personal background that is varied. So my lens on this bench is quite different. I'm Washington State's first black female Supreme Court justice. I'm the fourth immigrant born. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I identify as someone with a disability. And I also have um, the state's first LGBT Black Supreme Court Justice, and I'm the first Black LGBT Justice in the country. So my lens when I look on cases is quite diverse, quite marginalized, and very intersecting. Thank you. Ethan, you have the next question. Ethan, you have the and next question when you're ready. Sorry, guys. No, can you see it? It just, I just had it. You, I wanted to, I'll do the next one. I, this is just, okay. I, my screen just went blank. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Barbara, you want to take this one? Sure, thank you. Uh, Justice Whitener, how would you further equity and access to justice for all as a justice or judge? please provide specific examples of how you have furthered equity and access in your work and your judicial 
decisions. And you've actually touched on this and I'm very anxious to hear more. Thanks so much. Yes, and thank you. As I've indicated, I chair the training of judicial officers in our state, and I'm really proud of that. As a former co-chair of the Minority and Justice Commission, which was, is a Supreme Court commission, when I was a trial level court judge, that commission handled um, race and equity issues and how they impact our courts. Upon joining the Supreme Court, I then relinquished my co-chair position on that, and I moved to the Interpreter Commission because I believe language access is important and in our courts as well as since I am someone who identifies with a disability. In joining that commission, I realized that it was not addressing disability in our courts. So with the Chief Justice's approval, I started a task force to look at disability issues and how it impacts individuals who access our courts. I was the um, first judge in Pierce County that did the Color of Justice program. That is a program where I brought girls in from marginalized backgrounds and had them interact with judges I invited, females from marginalized backgrounds to inspire and empower each other and it went both ways. It was extremely successful where I did a proposal to the um, Superior Court Judges Association where they took it on and that program is to be um, conducted three times a year, different locations throughout the state. And that apprises individuals of our courts. I could really and truly have sat on my laurels, but what I did was I like to reach out, especially to the young individuals. I like them to see me as an example of what they can be if they apply themselves. So I share my stories, uh, good and bad, two young individuals, that is why I also took on teaching uh, street law at Lincoln High School, young individuals. And one of the things we did was take them to get them registered to vote before they ended my class. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Ethan, are you ready for the next question? Yeah, ready, sorry about that. Uh, Justice Whitener, awesome. judge, judges are expected to fairly apply the law and perform all duties without bias or prejudice. Please provide examples when you have realized and- Ethan, I think that the question is in the chat. It's how would you define restorative justice is the third question. Oh, sorry, I jumped it, I'm just, okay. No worries. Um, yes, sorry about that. Question number three, <laughs> apologize. Uh, how would you define restorative justice? To what extent are you committed to incorporating principles of restorative justice in your judicial philosophy and decisions? Now, first and foremost, the term restorative justice may mean different things to different people. And since I'm an extremely marginalized and intersecting individual, I always start with restorative justice starts with the presumption that there is such a thing as justice that needs to be restored. And that is how I think it needs to be viewed or defined. And justice is very simple in my eyes in that it is treating everyone that use, utilizes our court with in a just way. So having said that, the second part of your question is, how would I apply that to my decisions and how I uh, operate within the court? First and foremost, our courts are not our courts, it's the people's court. And remembering that and treating everyone that comes before us and every case that comes before us with respect is paramount in my, in my eyes. Secondly, my lens is marginalized and I have no problems voicing my position. So for example, something uh, training such as implicit bias is wonderful for everyone, but if you're a marginalized individual, I've never experienced implicit bias from anyone. Everything I've experienced from someone has been explicit because it's a manifestation of their unconscious, subconscious biases, and I can't read minds. So restorative justice, as far as I'm concerned, is trying to make sure that just treatment is meted out to all, which means we should not really not pay attention to who we are, but our intent doesn't matter, it's the impact we have on individuals that utilize our courts. So I do that with everything because it's just who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, you have the fourth question and it's been posted in the chat. Thank you. Please provide an example of how you balance the judicial principle of stare decisis or adherence to precedent 
with a rapidly changing society and advancements in racial, economic, social, and climate justice in your judicial decision making? Well, first and foremost, as I look at your question, stare decisis and precedent has, um, is, is really misunderstood from my perspective in that it is entrenched in tradition. But I will answer it so succinctly in this way. In order for me, such a marginalized individual to be seated here with the title justice, it means that uh, the law is flexible enough to adjust to the environment within which it works. And that is how I view stare decisis. Yes, we have tradition. Yes, we have laws that we are to apply equally and equitably to everyone. But let's be honest about it. We are not all equal. Therefore, equity needs to be applicable. And equity is meeting someone where they're at by providing them with the needs that they specifically need. So as I've indicated, I'm a person who identifies with a disability, but then I'm also a justice. I'm a black woman who wears a robe and gets titled justice. However, when I take that robe off at the end of the day and I walk out into the world, what people see is a black woman. If I'm with my wife, they may know that I'm LGBT. If they see me the day that I need my cane, they'll understand that I'm disabled. So as far as I'm concerned, stare decisis and precedent has to move within the society it is working within. So I don't see it as, as solid and it cannot be flexible. I see it as, as something that can move. And in regards to your question about um, social and climate justice, it's interesting you asked that because just last week I was at the United Nations attending an environmental climate rest restorative justice um, workshop that I was asked to attend and address. And I don't think we're addressing those things adequately. The Chief and Justice and I were the only two on a case that um, agreed to hear it and we lost. The other seven justices denied the case. Thank you. We will now uh, open it up to questions from our executive board members. Does anyone have any questions for Justice Whitener at this time? Just a reminder that these are one minute responses. Yes. Thank you. Quick responses to these questions. I'll, I'll ask a question, uh, Sarah. Uh, yes, go ahead, Barbara. So I would like to ask Justice Whitener, what would you like us to know about you that we haven't asked in our questions so far? I'm fascinated by the broad range of your qualifications. And I'm wondering if there's something you'd like to add that we didn't get to in our questions. Well, I think, I, I, you know, I view the law as something that is flexible, <laughs> like myself, and I'm not really entrenched one way or the other. I try to see cases as they come with the fact pattern that they come with and with my experience and through the lens that I have. So what you see is usually what you get where I'm concerned. Um, and I speak up, you know, um, it's a very lonely place at times, but it is, I didn't ask you to support me because I'm gonna give you the answer that you want. I ask you to support me because you believe in my skill set and as a judicial officer that I will be fair and impartial in my decision-making. And that's what I want you to know about me. What you get is someone who's hardworking, who will look at the facts, who will interpret the facts and try and apply it as broadly as possible. But we have to remember, we have extremes within our society and I, I try not to deal with those extremes. I try to encapsulate as many as I can with the decisions that I make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other questions? I have a few if no one else does. <laughs> All right. Um, so generally, in what ways do you think courts can better serve those of moderate or low financial means, both in criminal access and civil access? We talked about a little bit about equity, but do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, the court needs to get off its high horse and deal with people where they're at. That's why I've been a member of the Office of Civil Legal Aid. It's civil, um, it, 
we've been handling the, um, the backlog of the tenant problems. Um, what's interesting about that is everyone was focused really on tenants. And you have to remember many landlords for mom and pop, that was their retirement. So um, we came up with a solution and, and the um, Office of Civil Legal Aid addressed, tried to address it by getting funding. Our courts are really underfunded and we have to figure out how to do that by not putting it on the backs of people who can't afford it. So I'm, I'm very much involved in that. Technology is wonderful, but again, we're forgetting that not everyone can access technology. Even if they can access it, sometimes they don't have the skill set. So we have to really be cognizant of all of these wonderful ideas that we come up with. Time. And we need to be connected with the community to, to fix the problem. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, I can ask uh, one more. And this is a question we're actually gonna be asking our, our trial judges, but I'm just interested if you have thoughts on what role particularly trial judges should take in diverting defendants to diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration. And if you've thought about those things um, in the context of, of, of justice. Okay, so you said diverting them from, do you mean diverting them to? Diverting them uh, to, yes, diverting okay. them away from incarceration right. to okay. diversion uh, programs, including mental health court and drug court and those, those sorts of diversion programs, yes. I am a strong advocate for therapeutic courts. Jail is not for, for the average citizen. We're human, we make mistakes. That's what the law is about. And that's where I think my training in the municipal court and district court, which are rehabilitative focused courts, comes into play and then try and stop the behavior from becoming um, up to the higher trial level courts. I'm very strong, um, strongly believe that that's the way to go. Imprisonment, it, it, it works for the hardened criminals. I represented them years ago and I've put many of them away as a prosecutor, but that is not for the majority of the ills that face our society. Drug abuse, prison isn't the place for them. Mental health, prison isn't the place for them. And we have alternatives that we need to look to and try and figure out what is best for them. Many veterans ended up in prison when it really and truly their problem was mental health. So I say the court needs to continue to do that and do more of it. Less prison time, less prison for the average individual. I'm not talking about the hardened criminals. Some of them do need to be right where they are. Thank you. And lastly, uh, I think we're curious as to what you find to be most challenging about being a justice maybe, and what do you find most rewarding? I love the jobs. So I'll start with that first. I just love the law. I love, I always did. I was trial focused. Um, being at the Supreme Court, I love writing. And as a trial um, litigator and then a trial level court judge, I was always known for my writing. So it just really fit in quite nicely. What I don't like about the job is this. I should be in person with you. I have been the virtual justice. I literally have came in on the job in 2020 during the pandemic. We're still in the pandemic. The Supreme Court has not opened up to the public. And um, I think it's time that I get an opportunity to be with them. Unfortunately, that's not gonna happen unless I get another term because the Supreme Court during the pandemic, we realized that we, did not have a good air circulation system, the HVAC. So we will be moving out of the temple to go to you know, a temporary location. I was like, are you kidding me? But <laughs> that is how it is. So hopefully I get over this hump and uh, I get to you know, experience what everyone experienced at the Supreme Court, which is sitting with your colleagues in person on the bench at the Temple of Justice. I haven't had that experience. So that's been the negative for me. Something to look forward to. Do we Hopefully. have any, any last, last questions? All right. No, I just wanna say though, thank you for taking your time. I mean, it's a Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. and you took the time to meet with me. I mean, I think that's wonderful. It says a lot about you and hopefully I get your endorsement again, but irrespective, 
I'm going to continue doing what I think I need to do at this level, which is the best work that I can do with the time that I have here. So I thank you again for taking the time, meeting with me, and hopefully I get your endorsement this time around. Thank you so much, Justice Whitener. We appreciate you being here and we will end the recording now.